I want you just, before we read these eight verses, the first eight verses, I want you to think about what is going on. Because remember, this message that comes in God's word primarily was recorded to capture what the Lord was doing in David's life. Now, tonight, I pray that by God's Spirit's work in our heart that we will draw lessons that would be profitable for doctrine to know what is right and true about God and reproof where we have fallen short and correction how we can come into a way to guard ourselves from the situation that David went into and for instruction and righteousness how we can stay that way but first of all think about the setting think of the searing pain that would come when something that was your secret private sin gets exposed for all the world to see. That's what's happening to David at this moment. Just imagine what David felt as the truth of what he had done. I mean, he was known throughout the nation as this worship leader. And now everyone, when they sang his songs, we're gonna think what else he was. And he was feeling the pain of that indictment of his hidden sins. And this event and those emotions are what are flooding David as as this moment comes when the prophet of God comes to confront him in his sin. One of the great deterrents to sin is looking at the consequences. And God's word, let us see how David crashed through every barrier that was put up Every blockade that God put in his path, he just pushed him out of the way. And God lets us see the resulting wreck that David made of his life and his family. And this is the climactic moment that shows who David really is on the inside. Because this moment had happened a book earlier to Saul in 1 Samuel 15 where Saul was confronted with a prophet of God, namely Samuel, who pointedly told him about his sin. And Saul deflected the blame and said, it wasn't me, it was them, it wasn't my fault, it was their fault, I didn't do anything wrong. Now Nathan comes a whole book later and points his bony finger right into David's face. And David, without flinching or batting an eye, said, I'm guilty. And that's the difference. Both Saul and David were sinners. Saul wouldn't agree with God about his sin. David agreed with God and wrote about this for the rest of his life in his Psalms. Second Samuel, we're gonna read together in chapter 12, just the first seven and a little bit into seven of this story, and then we're gonna pick up with the next part when we get into the 51st Psalm. Let's stand together for the reading of this wonderful, insightful passage, 2 Samuel 12, verses one through seven, then we'll pray. Then the Lord, who by the way, wasn't deceived, knew exactly what David did the whole time, sent Nathan, who just found out about it, to David, the guilty one. And he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. Verse two, the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. Verse three, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Verse four, And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take one from his own flock and his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse five. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Wow. You know, God doesn't beat around the bush, does he? What an amazing moment this was. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer.
Father, thank you that by the miracle of inspiration, by the wonder of your spirit breathing out through 40 different men who captured your word and put it on paper, that it has been kept for us to this day, we get to have an on-the-scene recording of what happened 3,000 years ago in the man you wrote more about than anybody else in your book, the Bible. And I pray that we would be taken back by how David could go from the loftiest songs of worship to in one event breaking all ten of your commandments that he knew so well. And I pray that that man who broke all ten and was forgiven and restored and used and, and so delighted in by you that you call your son our Savior the son of David. Lord, I pray that we would, we would be taken back both by your, your righteous holiness and your, your unwillingness to allow any sin to go undealt with, but also your grace and your mercy that you did not give David what he deserved, which was death, and you did give him what he didn't deserve, and that was your loving forgiveness forever. So teach us both your mercy and your grace and help us to feel your love, but help us to always respect the truth that you hate sin and it will have consequences in any life that allows it to run rampant. Teach us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. When David was at the other end of that bony finger, I'm sure his heart was pounding. He knew who Nathan was. He knew who Nathan represented. And he, of all people on earth, knew that he was guilty. In fact, in the days ahead, as we go through the 32nd to 38 and the 51st Psalm, each one successively, we're going to see that actually David, in this year of hiding his sin, had actually begun to shrivel up and actually had gotten deeply sickened by the, the chastisement of the Spirit of God upon his life. But David knew he was guilty. David knew he had broken every law in God's book. David knew that he had broken all 10. In reality, David had successively through his act broken the, either the letter or the spirit of all the Ten Commandments. And a lot of people wonder how. Well, first the commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before you. David had allowed lust to be the God to which he had bowed his life. And he did have a God before God. And that was satisfying his own desires. The second commandment is, don't take the name in vain. And David had taken the holy name of his God in vain. As he said he was God's man, he sang God's song, yet he lived a lie like the devil. He deceived. And he did not keep the name of the Lord. That name that was to cause him, let everyone that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. David didn't. The third commandment is, thou shalt not make a graven image. And David engraved the image of a naked woman so deeply on his lustful soul that he forgot even the God he loved in that moment of sin. And he had made an image of a God, and he began to worship that God in his lustful desires. And he sacrificed. You know, who we worship is who we sacrifice for. And he sacrificed God for her. And he truly had made a graven image in his heart. The scriptures also say, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. David didn't keep the Sabbath day or any other day holy. For once he allowed his desires to rule, he had made every day of his life unholy. As he planned, as he schemed, as he figured how to kill this husband and make himself look like the proud newly married father of this child. The fifth commandment is, honor thy father and thy mother. David dishonored them and every member of his family as he sank into such a wicked and premeditated sin. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. David sent a murderous request to Joab, so it was not David's sword, but it was the arrows of God's enemies. 
that David used, but it was David's desire that Uriah be killed. And God says, if you look on one with hatred, it's like murdering. And David didn't want this man to stand in the way of him hiding his sin. So he destroyed him. The seventh command is probably the one everyone knew that David committed. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was the clearest of all David's law breakings, but the eighth one is equally clear. Thou shalt not steal. David stole the wife of his neighbor and his trusted friend and one of his personal inner circle bodyguards. Uriah was one of the 30 mighty men that were willing to lay their lives down for him. And truly Uriah did lay down his life for David, but David stole his life. Nathan clearly pointed out that David had stolen in that story of the ewe lamb. And David heard and felt that message. The ninth commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness, not lie. David's false response was a lie. When the messenger came with the ghastly news of Uriah's death over the river and Ammon, and even more, every day David lived in sin was a lie that he deceptively covered. He wept that his mighty man and, and moaned that he had died and been put too close to the wall when he had ordered that event. The 10th command, thou shalt not covet. David broke this law as he so coveted his neighbor's wife that he would steal her, kill her husband, and share in sexual sin with her. So David was a guilty sinner. David broke them all. And we think, Wow, that's really bad. But you know, for a moment, turn to James chapter two. This is a memory verse I can still remember my children reciting in Awana over the years, but it's a verse I think all of us older people should remember. The book of James chapter two. Remember James, the brother of our Lord, the earthly brother, was the pastor of the first church of Jerusalem. This isn't James the apostle. This is James the unsaved brother of Christ who after the resurrection believed on Christ, was gloriously converted, and he became the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And this is probably the very first New Testament epistle that was written in the 40s. But look what he says in verse 10 of James 2, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point. What does it say? It's guilty of all. So truly, if you think about what God says, every one of us are guilty. We all, by God's standard, have become guilty of breaking all the commands. And that's the lesson of God's holiness. Yes, David blatantly, premeditatively, and, and willfully broke all of them. But God says we, even if we keep everything and, and only keep ourselves down to only breaking one command, truly like David, we're guilty of breaking them all. We dishonor God. We put up a, any, whatever that sin is that, that we are willing to persist in, we make that more important than God. And we make that image in our mind where we can't remove it, whether it be the image of where we want to be somewhere in life and where we want to live and what we want to own and what we want to wear, or if it be as low as David's desire of another man's wife. But we set up idols in our hearts. So we have broken them all. But the good news is that Jesus died for guilty sinners. Jesus died for those who acknowledge they're guilty sinners. That's why David was a man after his own heart because David said, yes, I'm guilty. And it was just like a fountain opening up because he was so grieved by holding in his guilt for his sin. David, David's skid marks and crash into his sin with Bathsheba is a beautiful picture for all of us who love the same Lord to learn from. Because if anybody could fall that far that fast, then so could we. Because David experienced the Lord in a way most of us never will. Most of us have never been hunted for our lives by enemies. Most of us have never seen God miraculously work through us and slay giants. Most of us have never been able to, to go through hand-to-hand -hand combat like David did, protected by the Lord and never even be wounded. David knew God at a level that most of us never will in this life. 
But yet David, in that moment, fell so far and fell so fast. Those skid marks, we should watch this evening and by God's grace, heed the lessons that God put in his word. Now, each of these details that that we're going to look at in 2 Samuel are put there as mile markers. They're put there as as little scene, uh, accident scene markers as they chalk the shape of the body, as they plot the different angles that things happen. Just like at the crime scene, so God shows the crime scene of David's sin. And he says, avoid doing the same thing David did. If you remember last time we looked at David's first step downward, it's in 2 Samuel 5, you don't have to turn there, but do you remember David took more wives and concubines? Do you remember I shared with you at this point, David had let himself become involved in a socially acceptable thing that was unacceptable to God. God says, I made one man for one woman for life. And it doesn't matter if all the patriarchs had multiple wives, and it doesn't matter if every person in Israel has multiple wives. If you are the man after my heart, you should have one. But David took the socially acceptable custom of his day, and initially it was just carelessness. It was just a tiny loosening in a socially acceptable area. But David's sin with Bathsheba was sparked by small disobediences in the past. You know what that that tells us? The lesson is stay sensitive to sin. I've told you this many times, but I'll never forget my roommate uh, when I was in Bible school. Um, I mean, he was the all-American guy, dark tan, blonde hair, total athletic, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger before Arnold got old build, you know. And this guy was a lifeguard. And he was a lifeguard at, at, in Southern California's beaches. And he says, I love it. He says, you know, I get to sit up in my little stand there. And he says, and I just love it. He said, I love the ocean. He says, and I love the ladies. But he says, you know what? It doesn't bother me anymore. He says, they take their tops off. I don't even notice it. I thought, really? You're an unmarried college kid and a girl undoes her her bathing suit and lays there with nothing on. You don't even notice it? And I thought about that. And then I went to visit my other roommate's farm. He had 10,000 acre cattle ranch in Texas. And we went by Jeep to see his thousands of cows. And his mother, who was a real proper Texan, said, I want to show you something. She said, you're going to be a preacher, you'll remember this, and I have. She got out of the Jeep, and she pulled a hat pin out, and she says, watch out, she says, sin can desensitize you like a brand desensitizes a cow. And she pulled that hat pin out, and she walked up to a 1,700-pound Barzona steer, and in the triple whatever their brand was of their ranch, she went and poked that thing with her hat pin. Never stopped chewing its cud. Never felt it. It was so absolutely desensitized by the searing brand. And you know, at that moment, as she was doing that, I thought of my roommate sitting up on his little lifeguard stand, desensitized to sin. You know, he says, it doesn't bother me. I said, it should. And someday, if you ever get married, your wife will hope it bothers you. And I hope you never get desensitized to sin. David, he never thought that this incomplete obedience would desensitize him to sin. Well, secondly, look at verse 1 of chapter 11. The second step down, we also saw last week, is David relaxed his grip on personal purity. Uh, Everybody else was going to war. David just let little things slide in his life. He was supposed to be, I mean, in, in his life, he was supposed to be with the army, but he let that slide. He stayed home when everyone else went to war. Look at the end of verse 11, I mean, verse 1 of chapter 11. David stayed home. And, and what David did is he ushered into his life a series of unguarded moments. He didn't have his mighty men around him. He didn't have his counselors around him. He didn't have his closest advisors. They were all on the battlefront. David was, he was in this time of nothing to do. And you know, usually it's in those times that sin lurks closely. Because sin is looking for an opportunity in our lives. 
you know, it's amazing when we think we're safe from sin's reach and it won't bother us anymore. It's at that very moment that the ravenous devourer himself is crouching and preparing to spring. You see, Satan stalks us, Peter said, like a predator. And he wants to devour believers. And, and he waits for unguarded moments. When we think, oh, no, uh, you know, everything, I'm fine. You and I need to be doing whatever it takes to maintain pi- pri- the purity God expects in our lives. David discovered, only it was too late, that he had to keep his guard up. And he let it down. If you look at verse 2, David began to focus once he let his guard down on his physical desires. And, and what's interesting about this is it says in verse 2 from, that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof. You know what? He was restless. Do you know what Isaiah says one of the marks of sin is? It says the, the, the ungodly are like the restless sea. They just, they just are never peaceful. There's, there's a restlessness. There's this, they're just always looking for something else. And David got into that restless mode. And he just began wandering around looking for something to do. Kind of like wandering around to kill time on the computer or wandering around, you know, the, the mall. Just, just to kill time, just seeing what you can see. You know what, if the devil knows that you're restless, he'll find something for you to see. And he found something for David to see. In this period of restlessness with time in his hands, in a moment of listlessness and boredom, David wandered the palace and he used the highest spot in the city to take a supposed innocent peak down. And it wasn't just anywhere down. Remember, Uriah was one of David's mighty men. David knew his wife very well. He he could see her at all the court functions. Her grandfather was one of his chief counselors. So David had watched her grow up. She was obviously much younger than he was. And he had always noticed her. And now he was going to just take an innocent peek at her. What we should underline in our mind is this. There's no such thing as an innocent peek at another man's wife. And there's no such thing as an innocent peek at an off-color movie or television show. And there's no such thing as an innocent peek at pornographic materials, just like there's no such thing as an innocent trying out of intoxicating alcohol or enslaving cigarettes or debilitating drugs or of premarital try-out sexual relations. All of these temptations are only part of downward steps toward life-crippling habits, which can destroy your testimony and rob us of usefulness for Christ. It's impossible to flirt innocently with lust. And you know what? That's an amazing thing. That's why it says in Romans 12, we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. Did you know the world flirts with sin? Products are sold with flirtatious innuendo and sexual overtones. And after a while, we think that beauty is to be alluring. But in the Bible, God says those who are alluring are prostitutes. Interesting. Yet our culture says be as provocative and alluring as possible. And God says that's not a righteous and holy woman to be provocative. Read Proverbs 7. God says her steps lead to destruction. Well, David, David didn't realize that temptations abound and were crouching before him. Let's go back to James again. Since uh, it was uh, our Lord's brother, he seems so well spoken in describing the sins of the first century church. And in James chapter 1, in verse 13, we have probably the premier explanation of the process David went through. And th- this is what James says in James 1 13. Because temptation to sin is so powerful, God gave us this insight so we could know what to do. And James said this in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now listen to this. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now there's an insight to what happened to David. David was, 
was carried away. Do you remember how Nathan described it? He says a traveling man came and visited another man, and that man needed something, and so that man that was hosting him took, stole this lamb. The way Nathan described David's lust was it was just a traveling man that came by that David responded to. James, look what he says. Every man is tempted, each one is tempted, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. It, it's a traveling, it's not a constant drumbeat. It just comes at unexpected times and carries us away and entices us. But look what James continues to say. Then when lust has conceived, what he says is lust on its own does not count. But when we choose willfully to respond, there is a marriage between my will and that lust. And the union, look what it says. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You understand, we're going to be surrounded by lust. It's kind of like the pathogens that surround us. And, and if we're healthy and if we just do moderate care to, to not uh, infect ourselves, we stay relatively healthy, but not careful uh, with open cuts or with you know, putting into our mouth those germs, they can overwhelm us. And it's like that with us. Lust is always around us. And if we take precaution... It doesn't overwhelm us. But look at the end. When sin is accomplished, verse 15 says, it brings forth death. David was shriveling up and dying from his sin because it wasn't dealt with until Nathan came and pointed it out. Note that James, in verses 13 through 15, doesn't say if... It doesn't say, let no man say if he is tempted. Look back at 13. He uses a different word. He says, let no man say when he is tempted. What what James is telling us is temptation is inevitable. Temptation is inescapable. And temptation is going to follow us through all of our earthly lives. Temptation is there, but temptation arouses the interests of our lusts. And if we have fed them long enough and they're big enough, those lusts begin to woo our will. And when our will is not in step and guarded and kept through obedience to the word of God, we yield in our will to the lust and lust conceives and brings forth sin. Amazing. The message of, of James is that all of us are going to face temptation. All of us are going to stare our lusts in the face that we have cultivated. And all of us are going to have to either decide to mortify them and lessen their strength or pay the consequence of yielding to them and the death to our relationship with God and to our our usefulness to him that lust-conceived sins bring. Lust, the word in James 1, 13 to 15 is epithumia. Thumia is passion. Epi is super strong. It's passions that are allowed to be supersized, allowed to grow big. That's what lust is. And it can be any kind of passion. Uh, It can be a passion for food. It can be a passion for beautiful things. It can be a passion for excellence. It can be a passion for even doing things for the Lord. And they get oversized. And it becomes a lust. A lust to be seen. A lust to be recognized. A lust for whatever. And remember, the scriptures tell us that the youthful lust we nurture and feed as young people will chase us all through our life. Do you remember 2 Timothy 2.22? Do you remember what Paul said to Timothy? He said, flee the lusts of your youth. Why? Because if you endear them, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they will be stalking you for life. He says, mortify, pour spiritual roundup on them, kill them to the roots, keep them down. Lust, which tempts us to sin against God, always costs us far more than we could ever imagine. And that's what David finds. 
Well, back in 2 Samuel 11, let's look at verse three. The fourth step downward that David took, the first step downward was back earlier in his life when he didn't completely obey the Lord. And then he lost his grip on purity and he started fixating on his desires. But now, look at verse three. David begins to rationalize in his mind. And it says, David sent in verse three of 2 Samuel 11 and inquired about the woman. And someone says, oh, it's Bathsheba, it's the daughter of Eliam, it's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David took another step downward when he in his mind said, oh, well, it's really not that bad. It'll only be once, no one will know. Nobody's in town, it's okay. Each of us has an infinite capacity for rationalization not just David. According to Webster's Dictionary, rationalization is seeking, and here's the dictionary definition, to provide plausible but untrue reasons for our conduct. Plausible but untrue. David says, well, it's plausible that it was an accidental meeting. It's plausible that I didn't know who she was. It's plausible that she wanted to come. And he just thought, he, he rationalized this until it made sense. And it's amazing. What David was about to learn was how horrible sin is. Because David, in the passion of the moment, over the years, had slowly grown insensitive to the Spirit of God, saying, shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that. And now, he was deafened. You know, over the years, countless men and women who have descended into sexual sins have been asked the same question. What could have been done to prevent this? You know, after they blow up a family or blow up a church or blow up a company or blow up a political campaign. I mean, ask the governor of South Carolina and the senator of North Carolina and just ask anybody, ask uh, anybody. What could have been done to prevent this? And with haunting pain and precision, most of them have answered nearly the same thing. Most of them have said, if only I had really known and really thought through and weighed what it would cost me and my family I honestly believe I would never have done it. See, it's always in the moment the decision is made. It's not thinking long term. It's thinking of momentary. You remember what Moses said? Moses says that he, he resisted the, the momentary pleasures of Egypt and endured seeing him who was invisible. Now, he didn't say that Egypt didn't have pleasure. He said he realized it was momentary. Sin is pleasurable for a very short time. And it has a very, very rapid half-life. I mean, this much pleasure out of sin, the next time it's only this much, the next time it's only this much, the next time it's only this much. I mean, ask the Hollywood actors who, who have far gone beyond normal sins and now they have to commit sins with drug-induced additions and with multiple. I mean, it's unbelievable the length people go to try and extract a drop of pleasure out of what God designed to have intoxicating powers. And they can't even get an instant of desire and pleasure because of the half-life, the decreasing pleasures of sin. Well, I keep uh, taped in the back of my Bible something. It's a list. Many years ago, there was a, a pastor who came around and and challenged us uh, to, let me find it, there it is. It's taped on page 1105, right there. And and what he said is, he says, I challenge all of you, it was a men's conference and I was just attending as a normal attender, and he said, I challenge all of you to, to make a list in your Bible so that you can look at it from time to time of what would happen if you did what David did. And so, taped in the back of my Bible is my personalized list of the anticipated consequences of just immorality. I'll just read you, because all of us had to do this, and I I have it. Uh, First of all, toward my God. Uh, Immorality would grieve my Lord, displease the one whose opinion most matters to me in life, and would drag Christ's sacred reputation into the mud. I would lose my reward and commendation from God. I would dread the day that I would have to look at Jesus in the face at the judgment seat and weep for the days wasted by my sin. Now that's what we're going to have to do. Our sin is removed, but we're going to still weep because we suffer loss. 1 Corinthians 3 says, and 2 Corinthians 5, Christians under grace suffer loss because of sin. Sin's removed, record's gone, but our life 
is still going to be held before this, the judgment seat of Christ. And for all those parts that are all like, uh, you know how they black out emails because they've been censored and because they have intelligence information in them, our life's going to be there and there's going to be all this stuff that the Lord has whited out that's going to be lost. It's going to burn up. Another one is forcing God's chasing on my life in various ways through the inevitable work of Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9, the consequence engine. God says, even though I've forgiven it, you're going to suffer consequences. I mean, do you think that someone that goes out and commits adultery and destroys their marriage and family and they say, Lord, forgive me, do you think everything is perfect after that? Do you think everybody has amnesia and they go, oh, I don't even remember what you did. No, no, let's, oh, let's have a good time. Let's, have, let's start over, have a second honeymoon. They say that. But there's that deep wound that almost never goes away. Amazing. It would prompt the laughter and rejoicing and blasphemous smugness by those who disrespect God and the church and bring great pleasure to Satan. Did you know that's what Nathan said to David? You have caused the enemy of the Lord to rejoice. You're God's man. You're after God's heart. And what you just did made the evil one mock God. And that's what sin does. Well, secondly, in my personalized list of anticipated consequences of immorality, that was toward God. How about toward my wife and family? Immorality would heap untold hurt on Bonnie, my best friend and loyal wife. It would give up my credibility with my beloved sons and daughters. Realizing if my blindness should continue or if my family is unable to forgive, I could lose my wife and children forever. You know, there are people, they just say, I never want to see you again. Christians do that. They cannot deal with the, with the destruction that that person did. Now they say, I love you in the Lord, but I don't like you. And that is possible. You just can't be around them because they were so destructive. It would bring years of shame on my family. Can you imagine what happens when, when people meet other people and they say, oh, aren't you? Uh... Oh, yeah. That's right. And it, just years of pain. And of course, it brings plaguing memories and flashbacks that can taint any future relationships with anyone. And then, of course, toward church and ministry, moral impurity brings years of shame to all the church families. You know, what's amazing is pastors don't usually just serve one. I mean, there are very few W.A. Criswells and John MacArthur's that stay 45 years at one place. And what's amazing is a man can go around the country serving the Lord and at one of those stops have a blowout and all the way back down the trail, it's like the people go, whoa, I wonder if he was doing that when he was here. Hmm, kind of acted different. You know, it just it destroys the record of a life. It brings years of shame and hurt to fellow pastors and elders. It brings years of shame and hurt to friends, especially those you lead to Christ and disciple. And realizing guilt is very hard to shake, even though God forgives. I wonder sometimes, would it be possible to forgive yourself as you look back and think, why? So that's how dangerous sin truly is. And the momentary pleasures are gone so fast and the lingering pains are so deep and so unending. But now look back at verse 4 of 2 Samuel 11 and we have enough time to do it. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 4 says this, then David, I mean, he, 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 nothing was stopping him now. I mean, the, the, the uh, avalanche was rolling down the hill, pff, knocking everything out of its way. Then David, verse 4 of 2 Samuel 11, sent messengers and took her. I mean, I'm not even sure how willing she was at this point. I mean, she'd already had all this, the whispering of all the couriers and people asking her, you know, um, David was interested in her, and I'm sure that she's starting to feel a little uneasy. Because it's interesting, it doesn't say she came, it says they took her. And that's the point that this came to. David plunged his life into sin. Dove right in. And nothing could stop him. When David plunged his life into lustful sin, he forgot to do what he had done in the past. In fact, for just a moment, turn to Psalm 139. This is one of the most beautiful of, of David's wonderful inspired writings. And what David was saying in the 139th Psalm 
is that you can never get away from God. He's always watching. God is always there. He's always close. And the 139th Psalm talks about how the Lord knows us, verse one. He searched us. Uh, Verse two, he knows our location, uh, what we're doing. He knows what we're thinking and everything. But look down at verse seven. This is the the climax of this, this whole description of God's omnipresence. He says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand's right there leading me. David said, I can't get away from you. You know, that truth is even clearer. This Psalm 139, truth, that God is always there no matter what we do, is even more clearly captured by the Apostle Paul. And I would like to close there. That, isn't that comforting? Did you hear that? Close by going to 1 Corinthians 10. That, what that means is it's the last verse you have to turn to. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10. And let me show you something. This is what I hope you remember. Uh, I mean, sin is horrible, don't meditate on it, and and David jumped into sin. This is the part to remember. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you. Did you catch that? Overtaken you? Sin is pursuing us all the time. If you're a believer, then, then the world... Your flesh and the devil are all three on your tail trying to trip and cause us to fall into sin. There hath no temptation overtaken you except such as common to man. Now look at this. This is what I want you to remember. But God is faithful. The God David knew was always watching was still watching David in the avalanche of his sin, barreling just in in dreadful, destructive lust into the pit of sin. God was there. And God is faithful. Look what it says. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape. The way. You ever go on the interstates and when it gets like this, you know, it says runaway truck lane. I, I, I love going by those. In fact, when we used to drive a 40-foot motorhome with a 20-foot car behind it, I really liked it because I was always thinking about how you would get into that thing if your brakes failed. Did you know that there is a runaway truck lane that the Lord has always available for us when the brakes don't work in our life? But, but notice what David didn't do. David, who wrote the 139th Psalm and said, I know the Lord is everywhere. Wherever I look, he's there. Guess what? He didn't look for God. See, that's, that was the essence of what David did wrong. That's why God says that David was a man after all my heart in everything except you're right. Did you know every other struggle David went through, he always was looking for God. When he was depressed, looked for God. When he was discouraged, looked for God. When he was angry, looked for God. When he was afraid, looked for God. This time, he didn't want to look. He had decided he wanted to sin. He wasn't going to look because he knew there was the runaway truck lane and he didn't want to take it. This is a call to all of us who know and love the Lord to look for God in times of temptation. And you know what you find? You want to feel God close? Look for him in temptation. He's always there. Always right there. Regardless of the type of temptation facing us, we can be sure that our faithful God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to take. He will keep us from falling into sin if we ask him. That's what David didn't do. God knows our limits, and thus God always stands by to protect us. He always holds open the escape hatch so we don't have to succumb to the devil's snare. But the the deepest lesson of this is God is there all the time. I mean, if God is there in temptation, he's there all the time. He's there before the temptation. He's there to advise us how not to feed the lust, even prompt the temptation to be so strong. 
God has told us he's faithful. Whenever we think we're alone, we're not alone. He's there all the time. He's with us all the way. He's there every time. We never face an adversary. The prowling lion, alone. It's amazing to think about. Warren Wiersbe once told the story, you know, the, the great pastor at Moody Memorial and the great Bible teacher and everything, Warren Wiersbe, I love, have all of his books. He tells good stories. You know what he told a story about once? This little boy that went to school and he was a little shorter and the big bullies beat him up. I mean, they punched him and bloodied his nose and everything. The boy came home crying and blood in his face and his father said, okay, I'm gonna help you. He's, and he took him out in the garage and he taught him a few uh, self-defense moves and, and cleaned them all up and prayed with them and everything. And the next morning, he opened the door and said, son, go to school. And the boy says, the bullies are gonna be waiting. And the dad said, I, I showed you those moves and I told you that the Lord's gonna take care of you. And so the boy, with tears running down his face, trudged down the sidewalk, anticipating at any moment the bullies were gonna get him. What he didn't realize was that as soon as he left home, his father jumped in the car and he was at a very good near pace, always at a close enough distance that he could jump out and rescue his son. And that night the boy came home and says, hey dad, I didn't have any trouble all the way to school and all the way home. He said, aren't you happy? The dad said, I am. But he said, I was with you all the time. And that boy realized in that moment that the dad that he loved and trusted didn't just give him a few tips and pat him on the back. He came with him. You know, we can't go with our kids anywhere, everywhere for the rest of their lives. But God is faithful. And God will always, always be there and make the way of escape. To close this evening, I would like to do two things. First, I would like you, before you forget this, I mean, life is full. The Bible says don't merely hear things, but be doers. You know what would be good to do tonight? To take about a minute, and this is what I'd encourage you to do. In just a minute, we're gonna bow our heads. Don't do it yet. Think. I'd like you to bow your head, and I'd like you to, in your heart, Say, Lord, you know what I struggle with. And he does, by the way. He knows what, what temptation is common to us. And say, Lord, I want you to remind me and help me when I face whatever that besetting sin is. And Lord, I don't want to just remember that you're there. I want to look for you. And you know what you can do? In your heart, this is not out loud. You can say, Lord, I will look for you. And you know what you'll find? You want the greatest assurance of your salvation? Whatever besetting sin that we face, you ask the Lord to make the way of escape. Boom. You, you cannot believe how he is more desirous of you getting in the truck runaway lane than you ever could be. And it reveals himself to us. So let's take a moment to bow our heads and whatever your besetting sin is, just in your heart, Silently say, Lord, you know what I'm talking about. And then, then say, remind you, and then tell him in your heart that you're gonna look for him next time you're tempted. We have a minute before we close and I'll pray. Dear Father, even 38 seconds of silence is so immense. I pray that you would have heard hundreds of whispers before your throne of us, your saints, saying that we want the way of escape that you make, that we might not sin against you. And I pray this would be the beginning of all of us looking more closely for you and fleeing to you as our refuge from temptation. Thank you for the great truth that you are the God who is faithful. In your precious name we pray, amen.